Emily St. John Mandel's latest book, Sea of Tranquility, seems like such a perfect book for the moment, or at least specifically for me. This is a book that spans multiple perspectives and timelines. It's spanning over 600 years, starting with the British dandy, the sort of foppish Edwin St. John St. Andrew arriving in Canada in 1912, trying to find his way to do something, anything, he's not exactly sure what, and that traverses 600 years into the future as a hotel worker working on the moon colony in 2401. And frankly, I clearly love me some multiple shifting perspectives across timelines. I'm thinking about Anthony Doerr's Cloud Cuckoo Land, which I read and absolutely loved. But there's another sort of book that I recently just finished, absolutely love, that reminded me of this, and this Lauren Buke's Shining Girls, which follows a serial killer time traveler. And clearly, I like me a time travel novel as well. I'm thinking about The Time Traveler's Wife, also getting another adaptation. Uh, this is How You Lose the Time War. Love that book, as well as Version Control. And I honestly debated about whether I should mention the fact that this novel contains time travel, but it is written on the dust jacket after all. It's just, I find that it's almost better off going into these novels, not knowing that there's a time travel story hidden within there, because you tend to read the linear narrative a little bit differently. You start paying a little bit more attention or a different type of attention, and there's this tendency to want to overthink it. I don't really care about the science as far as time travel goes. I'm more interesting how it helps tell a particular type of story. And finally, with Sea of Tranquility, we have a novel that creates a universe that carries through several subsequent novels. And I'm not talking about, let's say, a series like Harry Potter or Hunger Games, but completely separate novels with recurring cast of characters. And I'd never come across that before until I'd recently read some Taylor Jenkins Reid. So we meet Mick Reba, who's one of Evelyn Hugo's seven husbands. He's reintroduced in Malibu Rising as the philandering dad, where we're also introduced to the homewrecker tennis phenom, Carrie Soto, who will be carrying Taylor Jenkins Reid's new book coming out in August called Carrie Soto's Back. In Sea of Tranquility, same thing. We're introduced or reintroduced to a Morella Kessler. We're first introduced to her in the Glass Hotel. Morella carries several chapters in the Sea of Tranquility. She's reminiscing about her friendship with Vincent Smith, also from the Glass Hotel. The two of them are good friends and travel in the sort of rarefied air of the ultra elite until that world comes crashing down around them. And Morella's husband, Faisal, eventually dies by suicide. We're also first introduced to Vincent Smith's brother, Paul, who's a composer in Glass Hotel. He also plays a very key role in the Sea of Tranquility. Meanwhile, in the Glass Hotel, we're reintroduced to Leo Prevent and Miranda Carroll, who we first meet in Station Eleven. And these must be alternate timeline characters because the post-apocalyptic event of Station Eleven doesn't align across all three books. But there still is a bit of meta-connectivity between Station Eleven and Sea of Tranquility that I'll get into in a little bit. But regardless, Sea of Tranquility, by introducing some speculative fiction aspects, means that there's elements of Vincent Smith's story from The Glass Hotel that I hope we can pick up in subsequent novels and really explore, and perhaps they can even explain away the post-apocalyptic event of Station Eleven so it aligns across all three novels. But who knows? That connective tissue, though, is something that not only I'm seeing, but something that the showrunner of the Station Eleven TV adaptation, Patrick Somerville, is seeing as well because he has just recently agreed to produce the Glass Hotel as well as Sea of Tranquility with his production company, which is frankly an unprecedented collaboration between a showrunner and an author that I don't think I've seen before. So I'll be excited to see how he sort of unifies those three stories as well, even if he does tend to deviate quite a bit from the text. But all of this begs the question, do I need to have read The Glass Hotel to enjoy Sea of Tranquility? To which I say that Sea of Tranquility is basically Spider-Man No Way Home. You don't need to have seen all prior seven Spider-Man movies, or to say nothing of the 23 prior Marvel movies, to enjoy No Way Home on its own. But if you're that sort of nerd that loves all those little Easter eggs and enjoy having some additional context to all the characters, then it certainly doesn't hurt. But back to that meta connection to Station Eleven. In Sea of Tranquility, we're introduced to author Olive Llewellyn. She's written a wildly successful post-apocalyptic novel that's currently being adapted to the screen, and she's touring it in the midst of a pandemic. 
which frankly sounds like something that Emily St. John Mandel would be familiar with. And frankly, she's admitted as much that this is a bit of autofiction, that all of Llewellyn's experiences are word for word experiences that she herself has had on book tour. That of, you know, fixating for days after a book event or someone in the audience asked if perhaps the last book ended a little too abruptly, seething with anger when an interviewer asks her what she's possibly thinking going out on book tour with a five-year-old daughter at home, and the experience of seeing a line from one of your books tattooed on the arm of a fan. But also significant is the fact that all of Llewellyn in the book is on tour for a wildly successful post-apocalyptic novel in the midst of a pandemic, which means she's asked constantly questions about end-of-the-world fiction in troubling times, which frankly is something that Emily St. John Mandel has a lot of experience with and is something that she gets to explore in this particular book. So there's a suggestion that this interest in post-apocalyptic fiction is driven out of income inequality and that a world that feels fundamentally unfair and unjust, there is a desire to just blow it all up and start over again. Or maybe it's this desire for heroism, that if there is some sort of catastrophe and the world were to end and be subsequently remade, that we too could be remade as a result and emerge better, more heroic, more honorable selves. Or maybe there's just this desire for destruction, that we want to imagine a world with less technology in it. And maybe there's just elements that are true in all of those for all of us. But frankly, if you look around, it does kind of feel like the world is ending, that we're on a collision course with the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, with the climate crisis, with the crumbling of faith in politicians and journalism, rising income equality, um, inflation, the rising mental health crisis. I mean, everything that's going on right now. Maybe we're interested in post-apocalyptic fiction because we're just looking for a playbook as the world ends around us. But then there's the notion that maybe the world is always ending and that we as a species are just so uniquely narcissistic that we believe that we are there at the climax of the story, that we are uniquely positioned to be there at the end of history, that after a millennia of false starts, we have now truly arrived at the worst it's ever been, and that we are here at the end of the world. But maybe it's always the end of the world, that the ending of the world is an ongoing and continuous process. Or as the book likes to say, no star burns forever, which joins It's a Great Life If You Don't Weaken as the two sort of survival is insufficient tattoo-worthy quotes from the book. I like Steve Tranquility, and I like St. John Mandel as an author. She's got a light touch. It's never overwrought. It never feels like it's MFA workshop. It just, it's this perfect little read that just slips by, ushers you from page to page until the end. And that's a great thing. It's literary flan. I mean, it's light, not too sweet, not overly extravagant. It's never going to make the top 10 list of the favorite things to eat. It, it's not something that I generally crave at a given moment, but every time I have it, I'm like, yeah, that was great. And she has this ability to rise my estimation the more I sit with it. After I finished The Glass Hotel, I was okay with the book, but in talking with other people at a work book club and elsewhere, it was like, yeah, there's a lot of elements there to pick apart that I really did enjoy. I think it's the same with The Sea of Tranquility. I finished it and I was simply whelmed as Book Riot would put it, and I'm okay with whelmed. Finally, I have to mention another anecdote that Olive recounts in the book that is exactly the experience that Emily St. John Mandel had at a literary festival in 2015 with American poet Kay Ryan, who mentioned the phrase, chickens coming home to roost, because it's never good chickens. It's not like, you've been a good person, so your chickens are coming home to roost. It's never good chickens. It's always bad chickens. Bad Chickens, which is yet another possible tattoo idea in the growing oeuvre of Emily St. John Mandel tattoo ideas. All right, so that's it for me this week. I know it's been a while. Let me just say that it's been a lot at work elsewhere, but I did get away for a relaxing seaside vacation. I read like a total of six books unprecedented for me. Maybe I'll talk about them if I have a bit of time. Who knows? It has just been crazy. 
but we are returning to in-person trade show events, which resulted in getting a haircut the first in two years since the beginning of pandemic. So my otherwise massively large Korean head feels at least a little bit lighter now, which is a relief. Reading, still no slump. I'm trying to get some more of the Book 2 Prize books under my belt for the octofinals. Hopefully that I'll be able to participate in, if not the semifinals. I'm not even sure where they're at. Honestly, I've just been so removed from the BookTube community for the last little while, and I apologize. Hopefully that can change as the sun comes out, spring is in the air, and just hopefully getting to see some more people. It's been really sort of isolating in the last two years, and yeah, it's been a lot, man. Anyway, I hope you're still doing well, reading, not falling into a slump at all, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon.